you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, um, yep, um, as, as introduced, I am James Meek, um, and this is Tony Wood. Uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to, uh, to be chatting with him tonight about his, um, his excellent new book. Um, it's, uh, it's clear, it's comprehensive, um, it's concise in, in the best way, uh, and having read it, I, I can reassure Putin fans that despite the title, um, there's plenty of Putin in it. Um, yeah, as, um, as, as introduced, um, Tony, uh, I think we can say, knows Russia well. Um, he's uh, been visiting since he was 16 years old. That first trip was a, a school trip. That's right. Yeah. Um, and um, since then, he's been back many, many times. Uh, most recently, uh, and very interestingly, uh, something I hope you can find time to talk about, the... Uh, uh, taking a look at some of the pension protests, uh, protests that have been happening in Russia uh, against the uh, decision to, to lift the uh, pension age there. Um, he, um, he's worked for many years as uh, an editor at the New Left Review. Um, he wrote his first book, um, came out in 2007, mm -hmm. um, making the case for Chechen independence at a time, I think it's important to say, when this was much less of a mainstream view as it would have been during the first uh, Chechen war in, in 1999. Actually, by that time, quite a, quite a controversial position. Um, he's now um, turning his mind to matters Latin American. Um, some interesting, perhaps, parallels there that we can talk about. Mm. Um, I noticed that uh, even though Tony's much, much younger than I am, we actually had our first um, pieces in the London Review of Books in the same year. Oh. I just managed to beat you by a few <laughs> months. Um, I was, I was uh, in, in Moscow at the time, just before I, I came back to London after a, a long stint um, working mainly for The Guardian there. Um, and it was, on the face of it, according to the kind of, um, I think we can say that the standard um, idea of post-Soviet Russian history, Russian history since 1991, a, a great turning point, a watershed. This, this is the, the way that we generally think of it. There was 1999, uh, Yeltsin stood down, Putin took over. Um, the 1990s were all chaos and uh, capitalism coming in, uh, and uh, you had Yeltsin, a very pro-Western, um, pro-free market, um, pro, um, pro-liberal uh, president, uh, and then you had the, the great statist Putin coming in, the ex-KGB man. He wanted to nationalize everything. He wanted the state to reassert control um, over the economy. Now, the, the, the central theme of your book is that this is wrong, uh, that in fact um, there has been much more of a, of a continuity. Mm -hmm. uh, would you like to tell us more about that? Yes, certainly. And thanks very much for that introduction. And thank you all for being here. I'll be delighted to uh, hear from you in the Q&A and answer any questions you might have. It'd be very interesting to hear what people want to know about. Um, yeah, I think the theme of continuity is very important to me because I think the, the idea that there is this sort of um, polar contrast, if you will, between the 90s and the 2000s gets at a lot of what I think people misunderstand about contemporary Russia in the sense that uh, there is firstly the contrast you describe between Yeltsin, the great Democrat, uh, and Putin, the authoritarian. And then on the other hand, or sorry, not on the other hand, additionally, there's a contrast between a kind of mar uh, opening to free market capitalism in the 1990s, followed by a sort of statist turn in the 2000s. And I think um, that that picture obscures the more fundamental similarities between these two uh, phases. So it's not to say that there is continuity in the sense of this being a flat line of development, but rather these are successive phases uh, in the development of a single system. And so once I started thinking about it in those terms, I realized that one had to rethink uh, many of one's assumptions about what kind of country this is. So in the book, really what I'm trying to look at is what has emerged from the post-Soviet, the collapse of the Soviet Union. What kind of country is this? What kind of political system is it? What kind of uh, society does it have? Uh, what kind of role does this country play in the world? Um, and I think if one looks at uh, the political system, for example, one sees that a lot of the, the instruments that Putin has used to cement his rule are, are fully constitutional legal measures that were put in place by the Yeltsin government and through the constitution of 1993. 
Uh, a lot of the other tendencies that one finds politically were also in place in the 1990s, but merely rendered much more effective and coherent uh, by Putin as a, as a more coherent and effective figure, really, that's the case. Um, and in terms of the economy, really one could say that you, you could imagine that the 1990s were a phase of the heavy lifting, of, uh, of smashing the old planned economy, uh, taking apart state-owned enterprises, transferring them into private hands. So by the 2000s, really, there was not as much of that kind of work to be done. And what you're looking at is a phase of consolidation. Um, I think one of the, the details I, I came across that I enjoyed is that uh, during the 1990s, every year there was a conference of Russian sociologists, which was called Where is Russia Going? This sort of questing permanent uh, confusion. In 2004, they changed the name of the conference to Where Has Russia Arrived? Um, I was um, very struck with your, um, your distinction between um, insider and outsider uh, mm. capitalism in Russia. Um, I mean, again, this is something that in, in your very persuasive telling uh, straddles the, um, the, the 90s and the 2000s. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's an evolving process, but it doesn't sort of, um, it, it comes across the, from the Yeltsin to the Putin era. Um, and I mean, that helped me uh, understand uh, what I was actually seeing in the 1990s. Um, and it's interesting that you feel it, it, it just went on. Could you talk a bit more about that? Mm, certainly. I think this, this in a way gets at that question I was, I was posing to myself really about what kind of capitalism does this country have? Um, because I think, you know, the, the, the common perception is certainly one that I had in the 1990s was that uh, the, the state has retreated. There is this sort of chaotic realm of private enterprise and there are these, you know, larger than life figures, the oligarchs. Uh, who have acquired these tremendous fortunes and who are exerting political influence on the country. So there was this, you know, why, in fact, the term oligarch started to be used uh, in, uh, I think, early 1997, if I'm not mistaken, when it was thought that essentially seven bankers controlled the, the, uh, the entire country, largely mytholo mythological. Um, but what I realized when looking at that and when you look at the origins of their fortunes is that uh, these figures were not... Uh, self-made millionaires who just sort of through the sort of sharp elbowed practices of, of entrepreneurialism piled up these fortunes. They actually were closely entangled with the state. Uh, they all acquired their fortunes by more or less being handed them at cut price rates during the privatization process and through being very well connected to the right figures. And once you realize that, then the question becomes slightly different, not how did business succeed in this vacuum of state withdrawal, but more what is the relationship between state and business? Um, and so at that point, I actually, um, the distinction between insiders and outsiders, I took over from a, uh, a Russian economist called Sergei Brazin Braginsky, who's done a very exhaustive study of this, uh, an academic, I think, based in Paris. Uh, and it, what he looked at was where all of the sort of top oligarchs made their fortunes in what sectors, what their family origins were, very detailed work. And he came up with this very useful distinction between what he called insiders, which is people with some kind of connection to the old regime, that whether they came from families with party membership sort of connections, or whether they used to be industrial managers, or, you know, have some kind of in. And the outsiders were often people who had no such access, but who became adept at operating in the cracks of the planned economy. Uh, and so this was figures such as Boris Berezovsky, Roman Abramovich, uh, and all of these people who were able to sort of work out how to gain the system. And th what I discovered was that it's sort of slightly different narrative arc where in the chaos of the Soviet collapse, it was the outsiders whose skill set uh, and capacities were most uh, useful in building a fortune. Whereas in that moment of massive economic collapse, the insiders who controlled factories uh, were not in a good position. Their, everything they owned was turning to rubble or rust in front of their eyes, and they couldn't make money from that. Um, the other factor which I think underpins this whole thing is the, uh, the collapse of natural resource prices in the early 90s, especially oil, but also metals were not performing so well. So oligarchs, again, who owned metals plants, who owned mines, in the early 90s, they were not making any money, but they had these assets. And then what happens is there is a turn of the wheel, both economically in terms of the world economy and the pickup of oil prices, and also politically with the arrival of Putin, who certainly does have um, a somewhat more status culture, I would say, in terms of who he is willing to promote uh, and who he is willing to grant access to. Uh, and a lot of the people with the Yeltsin era connections were slightly put to one side. So what I was discovering is a very long answer to your question, but I hope mm -hmm. it's useful, is that 
a, a, a sort of swing of the pendulum between two factions of the elite, the insiders and the outsiders. But both of these factions, it's very important to stress, uh, were very dependent on state largesse for their fortune. So there is no absolute separation between political power and private wealth in Russia. They are closely interwoven. The question is, which of these two factions has most influence in any given moment? And as it happened, these insiders and outsiders were, um, broadly speaking, distinguished um, by by two separate kind, two different kinds of, of economic activity. The, the outsiders found their way in through such uh, new phenomena as uh, private banking um, and um, a relatively, at that time, fluid, open media mm -hmm. landscape, um, uh, retail. Mm -hmm. Whereas the, the insiders, they struggled at the beginning, but mm -hmm. in the end, they were left with the actual productive mm -hmm. uh, manufacturing, uh, extracting industries. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, it's very, it's, it's interesting that a lot of the oligarchs who, who suffered most when Putin arrived were precisely the ones who had, uh, who owned media holdings. And this obviously is part of a slightly different story about the clampdown on the media, the urge to gain control over it. But um, the oligarchs who did well in the 2000s were all owners of yeah, metals and mines and minerals. So there is, yeah, that tilt happening after 1999. Another interesting way um, that you, you, you attempt to overturn the, the conventional understanding of post-Soviet Russian history um, is you're, you're talking about the, the red bequest, um, mm -hmm. this idea that um, also uh, a lot of commentators tend to assume that the, the Soviet uh, system uh, was a weight um, holding back the progress of Russia. In fact, uh, you argue that it was the other way around. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes, I have a, have a line in these perverse arguments, clearly. But um, I think, um, I mean, in some ways this goes back to what you were describing with the, the early encounter I had with Russia in the, in the 1990s, that, that I think that was very formative for me in the sense that I, I think for possibly Russia experts or scholars in an earlier generation than mine, they were much more formed by a different moment of, for example, in the people who first encountered the place in the 1980s would have experienced a kind of flowering of democratic culture and a much more positive, assertive uh, moment of, of, of that kind. Whereas in the 1990s, I really saw a, a moment of collapse of disintegration and disorientation. And so the question then became, uh, how is this going to recover? What's it going to look like? Um, and I think the... Um, that really affected my sense of what the Soviet legacy was, that people were really carrying on within the ruins of this old system, making something new in the midst of that, but that those ruins still had both meaning and practical purpose. Uh, and this is certainly the case, for example, in there are many towns in Russia where there's one factory that employed everybody. Uh, and I think in a lot of the Soviet Union, the factory was really the main social unit. So the factory would provide housing. It would uh, be the, the thing that organized schooling for the children. It organized uh, access to a lot of basic social goods. And that social infrastructure within the Soviet collapse was limped on in various forms. And so again, my, my formative experience of Russia, you would have people continuing to go for, to work for months at a time in somewhat dying factories and not being paid. Um, but these are people who are showing up to work every day working for pay that is delayed by six months or gets paid in some kind of physical object instead of money. And at that point, I started to feel that this is, um, you know, something vanished that continues to be real. So I think this combination of sort of the lingering uh, social infrastructure and set of expectations of the Soviet period plus confusion meant that um, I, I, I took that to mean to be an important dampener on discontent during the 1990s and 2000s. Um, and so in a way, that required me, I think, to flip the conventional argument on its head, which is that the sooner the Soviet infrastructure disappears, the sooner the past dies off, the better the place will be, the sooner it will arrive at the desired destination of uh, modern uh, normality. And I think, if anything, the reverse is true, that the sooner those things disappear, the more problems the current regime is going to have in tamping down discontent. I mean, that, that makes absolute sense um, in... in in the context of your book, in the context of everything I, I, I read about Russia um, since I left and, and when I was there, uh, I mean, the, the most obvious thing is, is that they are um, 
so many Russians live in the housing that was built um, during the Soviet Union. It's, it's, it's uh, maintained to a degree, um, but uh, what happens when that stock needs to be, needs to be renewed? Um, but still, I, I did find myself wondering as I, as I read your book um, about what is actually happening now. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, the, um, you, you had this, uh, this, as you say, this, this red subsidy, um, but uh, the kind of people that I saw in charge in the 1990s did not seem like the kind of people who having, if they benefited as Putin did from this massive rise in oil prices, um, which, which has played a part in the stabilization of, of the regime in Russia. Um, they, they didn't seem like the kind of people who would, who would start handing it out. They seemed like people <laughs> who might do everything they could to, to um, transfer it to, to yachts and villas overseas. Um, and, and obviously, a lot of this has happened under Putin. But what I'm not clear about is, um, has, to what extent has there been a renewal of the, um, w- whether it's, it's been uh, haphazard, or mm-hmm. part of some agenda, a renewal of the um, of the social infrastructure uh, in terms of education, in terms of health, in terms of, of heating, which is obviously very important in in Russia, in terms of housing. Um, what what's your impression about uh, about that? And and is it perhaps the case that despite the fact that there is this continuity um, of of capitalism? Um, mm-hmm. Perhaps uh, the Putin regime, maybe not Putin himself, but those working with him, still do have um, some kind of social conscience about mm-hmm. their um, uh, about the people as a whole. Um, that's a very good question. I think um, one of the, the the main things that happened in the nineteen nineties was that was a an incredible dispersal of uh, fortunes. Uh, so that uh, there were a lot of areas where the central government simply withdrew and devolved decision making to the regions, meaning budget cuts. Uh, so there was a decentralization uh, of welfare, which meant that some regions were able to sustain a degree of that social provision in a way that other regions were simply incapable of doing. And for example, Moscow, phenomenal concentration of wealth in that city. Uh, and so it has a, a much more functional welfare state than I think other parts of Russia do, whereas rural Russia, certainly even parts of uh, European Russia are in just an incredibly dilapidated state. Um, so I think the main thing is really that it's very, very uneven. I think there, are, there have certainly been, um, if you like, sort of outbursts of paternalism uh, by some factory owners or local governors who are willing to kind of subsidize certain things, but it's, it's very, uh, it seems somewhat arbitrary to me rather than structural. Um, so that um, the the economic recovery that happened in the 2000s um, and the sort of resumption of growth um, led to a, a kind of post-Soviet trickle down in a sense, right? That that the bulk of the profits accrued to uh, private wealth, uh, oil companies parked in various offshore vehicles in Cyprus, but some of that was used to fund projects of various kinds. So some degree of social infrastructure, some degree of uh, what they called corporate social responsibility, um, but but not, I think, not really as an urgent priority, uh, and not in any systematic fashion. So the outcomes have been very very uneven, and this is something actually that the the current Russian government is aware of, and aware that it needs to address. And so uh, Putin's speech after he won re-election in March was full of uh, developmental goals, spending more on education, on infrastructure, on roads, and such like, which have been wanting for you know. 30 years. Um, I strongly suspect they won't do that in any meaningful way because one of the other sort of motifs is, is as well as this unevenness in, in outcomes I'm describing is a push um, to further privatization. So one of the ways in which, I mean, Putin will be committed to modernizing education, but what he means by that is not additional funding. He means outsourcing of services or sort of further contracting out of textbooks uh, and very much in line with trends that we've seen in the rest of the industrialized world. So there is a sense in which whatever the West is doing and seen as a modernizing feature, Russia will think, oh yes, we must do that. So, and uh, this, we can come on later to the pension reform, that's very much in that spirit of what does a modernizing state need to do? I know, uh, cuts to education budgets and uh, further austerity. 
I mean, it's, it's an argument that I, I know is still going on in Russia. It's not like people aren't aware of it. It's not like there isn't mm. um, pressure. I, I was very struck with a, a report uh, on Russian TV just a few weeks ago. Um, a, a local government official somewhere in the Urals um, went on local television and she was uh, talking about uh, complaints that the government, the local government hadn't been doing enough for poor families. Uh, and she said, uh, we didn't ask you to give birth. Uh, and there was an outcry, um, a public outcry, and she was sacked, um, which I thought was very striking. Both, A, the fact that she said this. She was a young woman. She, she was only a child when the Soviet Union collapsed, maybe even not born. Um, and, and she said this, this very kind of um, neoliberal mm -hmm. um, sort of um, uh, conservative thing. Um, and, and there was an outcry, and there was enough strength uh, uh, and, and feeling within the local government that, that yeah, she did a bad thing. She's right. got to go. Um, so it's it's still in play, uh, mm -hmm. which is which is encouraging. Uh, yeah, I mean, and, and they have got the they have got the the oil wealth. You, you make the point very effectively that they are following, as you say, this this failed Western agenda of, of austerity, basically, and, mm -hmm. and privatization. Um, but on the other hand, they do have a lot of cash swilling around. Right. Yeah, which up until recently has been going on uh, various mega projects like the bridge to Crimea and uh, a lot until recently was being spent on upgrading Russian weaponry, for example. So they have variously skewed priorities. Um, I think uh, one of the interesting things about the, uh, the, the government officials that you were describing and their relative uh, youth, I would say, is that, the, that this is now we're seeing a generation of politicians who are ruling Russia, most of whom don't really have much experience of the Soviet period at all. So this is part of the idea of you know, Russia returning to Soviet times is that actually a lot of the people in charge have no idea what that was. It's mm. somewhat of a myth in their head. So there can be no direct return or recreation. What we're looking at is some other uh, layer of people with um, sort of you know, more, a more nationalist formation, if you will, rather than a Soviet formation. I think those distinctions are very important. Um, I mean, um, I, I know this isn't supposed to be about Putin, but um, I, I do, having seen him talk, um, mm -hmm. so, I mean, you know, so much of what he does and says is, is on, on TV, um, having seen him talk about issues, when he talks about economic matters, I get the impression he's not really interested. Whereas when he talks about um, uh, anything to do with war or spies, um, his, his, his eyes light up um, and his face is so much more animated and he's not just reading from little cue cards in front of him, he's speaking from his heart. Um, and um, you know, moving away from Putin, there is this, this divide, isn't there, in, in Russian government. It's almost sometimes as if mm -hmm. there are two governments and they're, not, they're kind of working on parallel tracks. Um, I mean, I, you talk a lot about parallelism in your, in your book, and I don't know whether this is one aspect of it, that, um, that uh, you wonder whether um, there, are, there are almost two governments, um, one doing the, sort of the social side of things, um, that the one that at the moment has less uh, favor, mm -hmm. um, and, and the, the other guys who are more interested in, in Ukraine and Syria and nuclear weapons and mm -hmm. spies. Um, I guess in that sense, it's like most other governments, right? That, that it's, a, it's a sort of aggregate outcome of different factions uh, within the state apparatus who have competing, uh, not sorry, competing interests, but they're contending for resources within the same power structure. I mean, I think there is this d distinction often, often made uh, about Russia that there are the, the power ministries, the Siloviki, so-called, and then there are lawyers and there are these other clans. And I think those sort of categorical distinctions are somewhat overdrawn in my view. I think the, the clans are quite easy to identify in the abstract, but once you sort of get down to the detail of who is supposed to be a member of each one, you find that you know, the same person is a member of at least three different clans, and I don't think that's how clans are supposed to work. Um, so I think to some extent this is really a, a product of a kind of policy ambiguity in terms of what is this state supposed to be doing at any given moment and where is it meant to be directing its resources. Um, and at a certain point they realize, oh, we have to spend something on, on social infrastructure and maybe we should pay the pensioners on time. And then at another moment they're thinking, oh, well, we must uh, you know, have some sort of build up against what we think NATO is doing in the Baltic states, so let's spend this on these missiles. And I think uh, in some ways the two governments thing you're describing is uh, uh, somewhat reflects this rather improvised to and fro between these different factions of the state. Uh, 
Um, I think partly because they, they, they really lack a, an overall kind of strategic design for what they're doing. You have um, a very interesting uh, passage chapter in your, in your book about, um, about the internal politics of Russia. Um, I, I, I'm saying the internal politics. Um, I'm, I'm trying to avoid using this word, the opposition, uh, because it, it's interesting, this word, the opposition. It's, it's very much a, a Putin idea that there is the government, normal people, uh, and then there are these people who... Um, who are making our life difficult, the opposition, right. uh, rather than seeing your political opponents as somebody who might take over the government from you. They portray it as a sort of anti-government chaotic force. Um, but yes, let's say the opposition. Um, you, um, you talk about, about Navalny um, and, and it sort of harks back to what you were saying about this, this continuity of the mm -hmm. Yeltsin and Putin years, which is the fundamental... Um, the fundamental dichotomy, the problem, uh, the fundamental contradiction, rather, in, in, the, uh, in the, both the Putin and the Yeltsin years, that we say that we're offering you democracy, but when mm -hmm. it comes to a choice between democracy and capitalism, capitalism always wins. Um, mm -hmm. And that same problem, um, you, as, as far as I understand it, you see as uh, bedeviling the opposition. Yes, I think so. I mean, I think the, uh, um, that what you're describing is exactly one of the reasons I see this continuity. And I think it's important to bear in mind that no politician in Russia has cleanly won an election advocating neoliberal capitalism. They have all had to either be very vague about their promises or promise the opposite. But um, so, for example, when Yeltsin won the Russian presidency, he promised reform. And he promised that he would improve people's economic condition in t within two years, but he, he did not lay out a program of shock therapy, which is then what happened. And I think that's the foundational contradiction of Russian politics in general, which is that uh, there is a requirement of democratic legitimation in order to belong within the modern community of nations, as it were. Um, but that is fundamentally not popular and not going to win you an election. And you see this oscillation within the opposition and specifically within the figure of Alexei Navalny. Um, I was very amused by this, that he uh, had this party to back his political campaigns and he formed it in 2012, 13. Uh, and within their program, it's, it's really the same prescriptions as were advocated by free market reformers in the 1990s. So the premise was the job has not been finished. We need to be elected in order to do this. And there's a fundamental problem there because those politicians were massively unpopular and their parties are now out of the parliament because they did not pass the, whatever it is now, 7% threshold. So there is no party advocating that uh, market reform agenda that will win more than 7% in an election. Um, and since um, he has spent some time in prison, Navalny has had a, a social turn. <laughs> I want to say this happens to every Russian major figure who spends some time in prison. It happened to Khodorkovsky as well. He had a left turn in prison, wrote an open letter. It was much more, we went too far with the market it's reform. The other way with Dostoevsky. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's true. Um, and so, and Navalny's current program is much more socially oriented. And it, in this program, it's we cannot raise the pension age. We must raise the minimum wage. It's a very much a kind of social liberal program, not at all what he was advocating three years before. And I think it's because, I mean, not just of spending time in prison. He's actually spent time touring the country as a presidential candidate and talking to people. And he's obviously a smart person. He's realized he needs to adjust his message to what the population is actually interested in, uh, which is not what any of the governments to date have been offering. So there's a, there is a fundamental problem within that, uh, that political sphere is that, and, and I saw this, I've, I've repeatedly seen this over the years, that there is a massive social constituency for a politics, for a broadly social democratic politics of some kind, and there is no party in Russia or movement that is offering that. That's the great paradox for me. Um, I wanted to read out this, this little sentence, of, except for the last few words. Um, the disparity between limited resources and lingering pretensions was the source of much confusion and frustration, the foundation for a great power nostalgia that was often divorced from any real attachment. Now, you're actually talking about the Soviet Union, but you could just put Britain in there. <laughs> um, and the reason I mention that is in the context of your chapter about Ukraine. Um, I just want to ask, do, do you not feel, um, obviously you don't, but <laughs> uh, you might consider the idea that perhaps, um, shall we say, the left um, is guilty of holding Russia to a lower standard 
than uh, the standard that we would expect of other former imperial powers, such as Britain, that we expect Britain to, um, I, I don't think they've done a very good job of it, I don't think we've done a very good job of it, but um, we would hope that Britain would come to terms with its imperial past, would understand <laughs> why um, so many people hate us. Um, and in the context of Russia's relationship with its, its former, with its neighbours, um, mm. do you feel that, that perhaps we, we are not in, in, in expressing sympathy for Russia's hurt feelings about um, the bad way it was treated over, over NATO and the raw deal it got mm. after the collapse of the Soviet Union, that we're, we're not holding Russia to the same standard? Um, Hmm. I think that that's a, it's an interesting way of framing it, and certainly that whole post-imperial comparison is very important. Um, I think, um, I guess I should be clear that, that what I'm saying about Russian foreign policy is not really intended to sympathise with the Kremlin or, you no, know, that's, that's very clear. say, yeah. pull them uh, yeah. having to send troops into Ukraine. Uh, it's, I mean, the way I wanted to really frame that was to, was to see what Russia is doing precisely in the context of the system of states within which it is operating. That is, what is its relative power within that system? And, and once you look at it in those terms, what it's doing in Ukraine, I would certainly criticize. Um, but one has to see that as not as an aggressive move by a more powerful state, but as a reactive response to the West by a much weaker state. So I, I have every sympathy with Ukraine as a country that is in the midst of these, of this, these clashing imperialisms, really. Um, but I think there's just a tendency within Western coverage to see Russia as this sort of innate aggressor that does these things for no reason. And I think those things need to be framed in their proper context and understood as uh, a larger struggle between groups of states. Um, and I think, yeah, in terms of the post-imperial question, I think certainly uh, Britain and France don't have anything much to lecture Russia about in terms of dealing with their colonial past. I think there is a, a sort of interesting ambiguity that Russians are still working through, which is I think they have a hard time conceiving of the Soviet Union as an empire at all. Um, and I think there are many people on the sort of peripheries of the USSR, the former states, who would not be in any, any doubt about that, but Russians themselves don't always see it that way. And I think in Britain and France, the debate is rather different. The question is, how do you, how do you evaluate the empire that definitely existed? Mm. And in Russia, there's, there's another remove to be uh, got through, which is, was this an empire, and if so, of what kind, and then how do we deal with it? So given how long it's taken Britain and France to deal with this, um, or still not deal with it, uh, then yeah, I mean, think Russia, it is just going to take time. Do you feel that there's um, a bit of a, a disbalance um, in, in the sort of uh, intellectual and academic focus on Russia um, when it only represented half of the population of the former Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. um, and for example, uh, the interplay of forces in Ukraine tends to be presented as um, a conflict between uh, Russia, the European Union, and America. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's all about Russia and the West, rather than the insanity of Russia not being able to form a normal relationship with a neighboring country uh, which speaks the same language as it does in most cases, uh, or a very close language, um, and, and which it intermarried with for, mm -hmm. for decades, that really it shouldn't be about Russia's relationship with the West, it should be about Russia's relationship with, with Ukraine. How, you know, how did this happen? Um, yeah, I think there are really sort of two questions there, I guess, in a way that the, the, the academic attention being disproportionately focused on Russia, I think that's not, um, not currently the case um, and not always the case in policy, policy terms because certainly in the US because of the strength uh, and influence of various diasporas. Uh, so actually there is a very large post-Soviet diaspora that's very prominent in, in the field of uh, ex-Soviet studies uh, and Ukrainian diaspora in particular has had a very strong role in shaping the debate within the US um, in a way that Russian scholars find somewhat sort of puzzling. It's a new experience for them to not be in control of that narrative. So there's a, there's an interesting, uh, if you like, decolonization process happening on the level of expertise, which again will take some time to feed through. Um, in terms of Russia's relationship with Ukraine, it's quite, um, I think, one of the things, again, that is part of the, the, the post-imperial syndrome is, is the, the inability to comprehend 
the separateness of this state. So in a way, because of that very proximity you're describing, the degree of uh, intermarriage, the family connections, the linguistic closeness, that there is a sort of, there was a sort of porousness uh, to that uh, connection with Ukraine. And so the fact of there being a genuine sovereign border between these countries is, is, hasn't quite fed through or is now traumatically feeding through, if you like, into Russian consciousness. Um, and I, I think in a way the, the thing that makes the Russian post-imperial condition very different from the British and French one is um, th these are all contiguous states. Uh, Britain's empire was all very far removed. It was actually, you know, uh, I mean, in demographic terms, certainly there's a lot of inward migration from the ex-empire, so not easily separable uh, in that sense. But on the other hand, territorially, these things are totally distinct. I mean, in a way, the comparable thing would be if Scotland had declared independence. <laughs> How well, would that it, work? It, it does sometimes seem as if the, uh, the question of Ireland is now uh, coming that back, way come back. Yeah. before yeah. Um, in that respect. Um, well, thanks very much, Tony. That was absolutely fantastic. No, um, and um, I'm sure the audience are champing at the bit to um, get their questions in. Um, does, would anyone like to um, ask a question? We have the roving mic is standing by. Um, who's first? Surely somebody wants to make a point. I can't believe that amongst this <laughs> extremely intelligent looking people. <laughs> oh, we have another, hit, another one here also. Hi. Um, hello. Hi. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask you a bit about uh, uh, you talked about nationalism taking the place of nostalgia for the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And I wondered the extent to which that was a generational thing yeah. and how that played out and to what extent the whole notion of the, uh, the the Second World War and the victory of the Soviet Union over the West was still a very dominant kind of cultural theme and if that if that feed, how that feeds into the, the the whole idea of Russian nationalism mm -hmm. uh, no that's a very good question thank you um, I mean I guess this actually goes back to the earlier point about the Russian post-imperial question because in a way there's an, a, yet another complication which is that Russia itself is of course a multinational state with something like you know 200 different national groups and languages, uh, 80 odd federal components many of which uh, contain majority non-Russian populations. So it's, it's the idea of what a Russian nationalism should be is inherently very complicated. Uh, Boris Yeltsin actually introduced uh, very early on in his career that, uh, an important distinct vocabulary vocabulary distinction uh, between two words for Russian. One Ruski meaning ethnic Russian and one Rasiyanin meaning civic Russian. Um, and this they continue to use and so the Russian, it's important to say that the Russian nationalism of figures such as Putin is intended to rhetorically certainly be a, a civic nationalism of this larger multi-ethnic kind. It's not a, an ethnic chauvinism. Uh, and I think that distinction gets elided in much of, much of the coverage because English doesn't have this distinction between the words. But if you look at the official pronouncements of the Russian state, they are often very clearly gesturing to that larger multi-ethnic whole. Um, and it's complicated, again, within that because despite it being multi-ethnic, Russians are overwhelmingly the majority within that state, 80%, I think, if I'm correct. Um, so there's the balancing of the, the demographic dominance of the Russian component with this larger claim to sort of post-imperial multi-ethnic status. Um, and yet the achievements of the Russian state to which they are now harking back are all the achievements of an ethnic Russian core conquer conquering the rest of this territory. So it's an inherently ambiguous process. Um, and again, I'm not sure really Britain is an analog for this. Uh, it could be, but I'm not sure it really is. Um, in terms of the, the role of the Second World War, I think, I mean, it's really important to say that in, in Russia, this is not really seen as a victory over the West or even a victory over Germany. This is really seen as a victory over fascism, as a rival sort of nihilistic uh, political system and ideology. And it's, so it's not even seen as a victory over capitalism within the Soviet cosmology. So, and this is partly this obviously Russian official TV played on this very heavily in the case of Ukraine and to, to cast the Ukrainian government as sort of latter-day fascists of some kind. But it was precisely as 
fascists rather than as Westerners that they were put in that mold. Um, and this is already somewhat mythologized now, this idea of World War II, but it's, there is a complicated, uh, I hesitate to use the word game going on, but a series of maneuvers being made to link both this really unprecedented modern multi-ethnic federal state with the systemic achievement of a communist system in World War II with an older imperial tradition that they have to somewhat deny because of its sort of conquering nature. So I think those ambiguities are currently what constitutes Russian nationalism. And I think we really can't say it's a coherent entity yet. Any other? Yes, there's a question at the back. Hi, thank you. I was just wondering in the context of foreign policy and geopolitics at this moment, you know, it seems to be that we're back to the narrative of Russia versus the West, which you refer to in the context of Ukraine. But it seems like democracy, democracy is kind of in decline across the world. And there's this narrative that Russia is actively helping to subvert it through disinformation campaigns. And as we see playing out in the Brexit campaign or with the Mueller investigation, to what extent do you think, you know, that's just hysteria and to what extent do you think that is going to be a real challenge for kind of the global world order? Good question. Thank you. Yeah, that's well, my next book. Uh, I was hoping somebody would ask that. Yeah. Um, I, I guess I'm quite skeptical of this idea of a threat to democracy. Firstly, because of I'm not really clear what people are defining and defending as democracy in this instance. Uh, if you're talking about the, the electoral process, or are you talking about the larger system of legitimation, or are you talking about a set of values? And I think really Russia on its own is not powerful enough to put a dent in that. I think all of the trends that are being described as, as fed and nourished by Russia have been underway for a long time. I think in terms of the hollowing out of democratic culture, that's been happening for decades in terms of you know, declining voter participation, declining you know, membership of parties until relatively recently with you know, some exceptions. Um, so the, and, and also a lot of these are, are really symptoms of an ongoing kind of crisis of Western industrial capitalism that has not really arrived at a substitute for that model of growth. So I think these are really longer term symptoms for which Russia is a very short term uh, sort of bogeyman. Um, I think you know, certainly Russia has been up to plenty of things in all of these places, sort of poking at various uh, you know, holes in the armor. But, um, but I don't think it's really uh, modeling for itself a, a coherent strategic threat to the West. I don't think it really sees itself in that role. Apart from anything else, uh, I don't think really Russia has an interest in destroying what we think of as Western democracy. That's not useful. If you bear in mind who is buying all of Russia's oil and gas, you know, there's a great deal of talk of Russia pivoting to China and these new strategic alliances, but actually more than 50% of Russia's trade is with Europe. So it's really not, you know, those kind of, uh, the, the specter of disintegration that people are worried about Russia sort of really going for it. That's, that's not what they're going to do. That's not what they want, as far as I'm aware. It's all rather, commonsensically, that doesn't look to be a good strategic goal for them, put it that way. Um, and with the US, I think it's not really clear what is happening there, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the question's going thinking fast, sir. Just, just, hang on. Sorry, I, I can project if necessary, but uh, I'm finding all this a bit bland. I mean, to many of us, Russia is a hideous kleptocracy. There are rumors that Putin has a vast fortune that he's salted away. And so I'm intrigued why the liberal intelligentsia and so on are not more protesting. Have they been bought off by consumerism? Or is it that they're too obsessed with shopping in New York and so on themselves? You mean the Russian liberal intelligentsia? Yeah, exactly. Why are they so bloody useless? Why, why is there no Lenin? Um, hmm. uh, well, let me think how to phrase this. I mean... The question really is, um, and, and what I'm trying to say in the book, is that Putin as a personage is not the, the key question here. Um, if you got rid of Putin tomorrow, which, by the way, I would be very happy about. I, I have no <laughs> personal, uh, uh, whatever the word is, 
Yeah, brief, thank you, uh, for Putin. But the question is really what would replace him? Not just who would replace him, but what is the alternative to this current system that is in place? And what is the reason I think uh, Russia is not, there is no uh, stronger challenge to Putin and not a more effective opposition is that no one really has an effective systemic alternative to this whole architecture of power and money that has been ruling the country for the last 20 years. Now, the problem really is that that's a very big task to ask of anyone, and especially a sort of disorganized, very numerically small opposition that is geographically quite dispersed. And I should also say they're facing a quite a strong repressive state apparatus, which can just slam people in prison with great ease uh, and impose punitive fines for dissent on the street. I mean, these are like, you know, multiple times the yearly minimum wage that people get fined with if you get arrested at a demonstration in Russia. So the repressive power of the state is out of proportion to the capacities of the population to oppose it, number one. Secondly, I mean, this uh, James mentioned earlier that I was in Russia this summer and attended various of these pension protests. One of the very interesting features is that at one of the demonstrations, it was on 9th of September, it was uh, organized by Navalny. And there, was, there were two groups of protesters, I would say. One very active core, who were all, I would say, in their late teens, with placards, shouting slogans, perfectly keen to get arrested. And then surrounding them, a much, much, much larger number of people of diverse ages, quietly holding placards, but willing to drop them the minute the police move in. I don't know how far one could take that as a model of Russian society at large, but I think there is a kind of a small active core of opposition and a much larger passive opposition that is waiting to see what takes shape and then will join uh, the side that has the momentum, if you will. So I think in answer to your question about why is there not more opposition, partly is that, that most of the population doesn't see a particular reason to sacrifice uh, their bodies, livelihoods for the sake of an opposition that doesn't have a real alternative. But as and when something does manifest itself, I think that picture could change very, very quickly. So it's, I think it's one of the features of this system is that it looks very, very strong, but it's actually quite brittle in certain areas. That was another person. Yes. That's been uh, very uh, fascinating. Thank you. I could ask many, many questions, but uh, I'll ask a couple. Um, one, um, uh, Senya Sobjak spoke at Pushkin House uh, earlier this year. I just wondered what you thought about her. I actually found her very articulate and very interesting. I just wondered how you think she fits into this. She answered Navalny's, Navalny accused her just before the election when he was in jail of being part of the system. Mm -hmm. So I could go on about this, but yeah, and I'd just be interested to know um, what, what your thoughts on on uh, Senya are. And secondly, um, I was just down in, in Armenia and uh, Nagorno Karabakh, and I met some soldiers there, and they're they're still getting sent up to Russia to get trained. Mm -hmm. And the Russians. So the the question is more about you said the Russians. You know, we can have some sympathy over Crimea. They're not that aggressive. But if you look at Abkhazia, South Ossetia, if you look at the, I mean, if you, the, the the Baltics, they're flying planes. Or, you know, into other people's airspaces. Mm -hmm. um, one that's very. Exp but sorry, this will be a question. Um, but one 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 that that's very expensive. Can they afford to keep sort of trolling their borders? And mm -hmm. uh, and secondly. Uh, why? why? Why Why are they so aggressive in this way? So I know that's a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just to be clear, I didn't say they, I, we should have sympathy with them for annexing Crimea. That's very much not my position on that question. Um, really, in terms of uh, the aggression, I'm saying that these, are acts of, these acts of aggression need to be understood as what they are, which is acts of aggression by a vastly less powerful force. And they're desperate improvisations rather than part of a deliberate uh, expansionist plan. That's how I would frame that. So it's, I'm, I'm not doubting the act of aggression, but I'm saying that it's, it needs to be framed in its proper relative terms. Um, the question about why is it training arming Armenian soldiers? Uh, I think um, I'm not very well versed in Armenia, but certainly the question of Abkhazia, South Ossetia, and these sort of territories, part of that uh, in a way, you could see what happened in Abkhazia and South Ossetia, which are now de facto Russian territories, formally independent. But um, they're dry runs for what happened with Crimea, which is that the prospect of NATO membership is raised for Georgia. Uh, and this is a way of ruling that out. 
if, you, if you're a country which has an ongoing internal conflict, you can't be a member of NATO unless you're Turkey. But, uh, and ditto uh, Ukraine and Crimea. The annexation of Crimea is designed to say to the West, if you want to admit Ukraine, try doing it while we're occupying a chunk of their territory. <laughs> right? So these are very much aggressive uh, deterrent moves, which may or may not work. Right? Um, and Armenia, I think, fits into that pattern of wanting to maintain a influence over the armed forces or certainly the armed peri perimeter around its borders. In terms of the expense, I think, you know, it's not that expensive. I mean, Armenia does have a very substantial military, but it's not on the scale of, I mean, it, in a way, it's like what it costs the US to be arming the Georgian military. It's, it's expensive in terms of, I mean, that money could be put to much better uses, undoubtedly. And certainly within Russia, there's a crying need for money on things other than weapons for the Armenians. But relative to the overall budget and what they decide the military capacities they need are, it's probably quite small beer. Um, with regard to Ksenia Sobchak, I think, I mean, there's a tendency within Russian political discourse towards the, the, the conspiratorially minded, if you will, uh, and especially within an opposition as fragmented as this one is, there's a great deal of suspicion of any one figure being on the payroll of someone else intended as a plant to divide the opposition. So the opposition is often divided because they're convinced the other one is trying to divide them. This is this sort of uh, inescapable game. What I would say about Sobchak, I don't I mean, she, her position may have moved over time, but she certainly played a kind of curious role in these protests of 2011-12, where she was very much a, in favor of rerunning the elections, having clean elections, but not taking power, not having a political movement to do that, and not forcing through any systemic change. So in a way, whilst she may not have been funded by anyone to say that, the effective, uh, the politics behind her stated positions were please change as little as possible. Uh, so there's an, there's an anti-Putinism which is confined to opposing Putin himself. And I think she could fairly be described as a representative of that tendency, whereas Navalny is moving in a, more, in a direction more favorable to reforming the system, we'll put it that way, and we'll bring in significant changes, anti-corruption legislation, uh, what the word is, lustration of former officials. And I'm not sure where Sobchak stands on all of that. So there's a sense in which she's trying to occupy some of the same space as Navalny, but not as uh, decisively and not as anti-systemically, I would say. Well, I'm sure that um, you have appetite for more, but um, sadly, I'm probably going to have to wrap it up there. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Tony, for sharing your thoughts. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.